this week we have Jackie uh, presenting on her research, and Basim and I will be the host and introducing Jackie. Introducing Jackie, yeah, actually, it's slightly more appropriate for her to introduce me because most of the young people, at least this year, students, uh, we haven't yet met, frankly, <laughs> maybe with some of you. So, you know, Jackie very well, she's our graduate program director, but beyond that, she's a great collaborator and colleague. Jackie came to us with a PhD from Stanford, she did a postdoc at Scripps. And then uh, she had a faculty position at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in the greater Albany area. I joined the school here about a year after Jackie. So we really started our career together and we discovered that we shared love to microbes. <laughs> and that was really a string that led us to collaboration, multiple projects, but also love to to a sets of tools, we call it flow cytometry, if you're familiar with flow cytometry. And Jackie, really, we had really cool discussions about the technology. We developed a project together. We have multiple publications on microbes in general, but particularly on things of interest to disease. Uh, we, we even describe a new species of microbes belonging to this group that are relatively understudied. And Jackie really was a pioneer, frankly, in some aspect of the biology of the, these microbes, pioneered work, and she's gonna present some of her latest discoveries today. Jackie, yeah. it's all yours. All right, thank you, Basim. Yeah, I will tell you very briefly that whole story of, about Basim and me and QPX as I go through today. Um, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, to those who can't be here and are maybe watching this on Zoom, I'm really sorry about the COVID-driven pushback of my schedule. I am glad that I feel much better, not 100%, but much better than I did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so what I want to do today is I want to tell you why I've spent my time since I arrived at Stony Brook establishing an entirely new study system in a group of organisms I had never heard of before I got to Stony Brook. And what it is I find so interesting about them that I took this really big and probably maybe not very smart or strategic risk of uh, developing a research program on the Thrausokitrids and the Labyrinthiomyces in general. And in particular, my model organism, the mangrove Thrausokitrid Arantiochytrium. And I'm going to start by grabbing my phone so I know what time it is. And uh, by assuming that most of you also, like me when I got here, have never heard of Thraustokitrids. Uh, so I'll spend the first chunk trying to explain to you what a Thraustokitrid is and why they're important and interesting sort of in general. And I'm gonna start with this image by explaining the common and still very common method for isolating these organisms, which is to take a sample of seawater or a slurry of sediment in seawater and add some pollen grains. In this microscope image, these big brown gold blobs or pollen grains. Wait a couple of days, pull out the pollen grains, and you are likely to find that they have been colonized by vegetative cells, which are these kind of clear globules here of probably thraustochytrids, but could be other levirentulomycetes as well. So what's happened is that either zoospores that were present in the initial sample or were released from sporangia that were present in the initial sample have been attracted to the pollen grains as a food resource. They settled on the pollen grains, they transformed or developed into vegetative cells, which I may sometimes call thalli, which have a special structure, I'll tell you more about later, that they use to attach to the substrate, digest the substrate, and take in nutrition for growth. A zoospore is typically three to five microns in its biggest dimension. And a mature thallus, depending on the species, is 20 to maybe 50 microns before it releases the next generation of cells, which might be zoospores or might be something else. Uh, Ragukumar, Sashigiri Ragukumar, who is one of the eminent experts on all things to do with marine fungi and fungus-like marine organisms, has called the Labyrinthiolomycetes the most common fungus-like organisms in the sea. Uh, 
So I want to spend a few slides talking about the most common part and the fungus-like part of that description. I think you can get an idea why they might be described as fungus-like from what I just told you, right? They're heterotrophic organisms. They digest an organic matter substrate to support their growth. That's kind of fungus-like growth habit. And indeed, these organisms, they're not only heterotroph, they're osmoheterotrophs. That means they like heterotrophic bacteria and like true fungi, they take up only very small organic compounds, an amino acid, a nucleic acid, a monosaccharide, for example. And they live mainly, we think, as saprobes. So they mainly break down dead uh, organic matter and help it to decompose and remineralize. That could be from plants, from algae, from animals. And as I've just shown you, at least some of them, probably not all of them, but at least some of them can break down some really refractory materials, which pollen grains are super refractory. And the reason they're used to isolate these organisms is these are by far the most abundant organisms in seawater that are capable of breaking down sporopollen and then using pollen grains as a food resource. So it's a selective isolation method. In my understanding of this group of organisms, they are obligately marine. They require some salinity, maybe not a lot of salinity, you know, really brackish, like two or three parts per thousand, maybe just fine up to full strength seawater, but they are not a freshwater group of organisms. <clears throat> a feature of their uh, physiology and ecology that really distinguishes them from heterotrophic bacteria and fungi is their ability to synthesize and store large amounts of very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. And I will tell you more about that in just a minute. And they can make those de novo. They don't need to take in fatty acids to make long chain fatty acids. They can make it from any carbon source. Right, I wanna take a detour from there to go to the most common part of my description. So based on enumerations using the pollen method, uh, there's also an acroflavin staining method. We've developed some qPCR methods. Uh, and of course, there are general metabarcoding and metagenomic studies. And based on all that information, we know that labyrinthiolomyces are everywhere in the oceans. Estuaries to open oceans, in sediments from the tropics to the poles, in the water column from the surface to great depths, basically everywhere. And we also know that they're often associated with marine plants and animals. And that latter part is actually how I got introduced to this group because my arrival along with Bossoms and Stony Brook coincided with the first outbreak of QPX disease in heart clams in Raritan Bay. Um, and I was fortunate that Bossom asked me to get involved and help studying this phenomenon. Although I will admit that my first response to him was, no, I'm not really interested in sick clams. But then <laughs> I went and read about the QPX disease organism, which is a Thraustochytrid. And I learned about this group of organisms called Thraustochytrid. And I was fascinated from the beginning. And it's all gone from there. Um, so they're found everywhere. They can be very abundant. So abundance estimates range from about a thousand to a million cells in a liter of seawater, about a hundred to 10,000 cells in a gram of sediment. The higher numbers are detected when there's more labile fresh organic matter available, no surprise there. And at the high end, the estimated biomass of labyrinthiolomycetes can exceed the biomass of all the heterotrophic bacteria. So they can at least sometimes be really important decomposers in the ocean. And probably all the time, they're at least somewhat important decomposers. All right, back to this long chain fatty acid thing. The particular long chain fatty acid that these organisms produce is DHA, docosahexaenoic acid. If that sounds familiar, that's because it's an essential omega-3 fatty acid. We have to get it in our diet. And you can go to the health food store right now and you could buy a DHA supplement that's made from therostochytrids. It might say single cell oil, it might say algal oil, it might say schizochytrium. It's probably gonna be made from enterantiochytrium. There's reasons they don't call it that, um, that are entirely legalistic. Um, one of the reasons this is popular is because it takes pressure off wild fish stocks, which are otherwise the main source of essential omega-3 fatty acids for human food. And as far as I can tell, 
Uh, Thrastokitrids are the primary source of DHA in baby formula, for example. They're used to enrich aquaculture feed. This is big, big business, right? One of the gigantic nutraceutical companies, DSM, this is one of their core businesses, is production of DHA from thrastokitrids. Um, a little interesting side note, rather than producing DHA by a standard fatty acid biosynthetic pathway, the thrastokitrids have a special polyketide synthase, like so-called PUFA synthase, that produces the DHA in the cells. And Arantiochytrium can produce half its biomass as DHA. The cells can be so fat in the lab that it is really hard to centrifuge them down. They keep floating back up. <laughs> it, it's hard to believe it's healthy for them, right? But that's what they do when they have a lot of carbon available. So it's obviously, right, it's been suggested that Trostochytrids might also be an important sources of DHA to uh, marine animals for which it's also an essential fatty acid. And particularly in detritus-based marine food webs where the detritus itself from Spartina or a mangrove leaf or whatever is really poor in nutritional quality, that thraustochytrids could contribute to trophic upgrading by adding not only amino acids, but essential fatty acids. And one of the things I would eventually love to figure out how to do is put some numbers on that pathway. Not there yet. Okay, uh, still working on the fungus-like part of the description. This is a still very um, nice representation of our current understanding of eukaryotic diversity. So the last common ancestor of eukaryotes probably existed about 2 billion years ago. And down here at the tree would be our, our closest relatives, the archaea, from whom we are descended. The fungi belong to a group over here called the opisthocons, as do we. Here's our cute little branch of animals. All the animals are that tiny little branch right there. The fungi are over here. The labyrinthiolomyces are on the other side of this tree in a group called the stromenopiles. Those of you who have heard of stromenopiles previously might be thinking, oh, I thought stromenopiles were photosynthetic organisms. And yes, many of them are. This crown group at the tip includes diatoms, kelps, ariococcus, a whole lot of the other, the rest of the broad diversity of marine photosynthetic eukaryotes. But the basal lineages of stromatophiles are all heterotrophic. That includes the phycosoesids. Uh, you may never have heard that name either, but these are heterotrophic nanoflagell nanoflagellate predators in planktonic ecosystems. The oomycetes, if you don't recognize that term, you have heard of oomycetes, Irish potato blight, sudden oak death. These are all plant pathogenic oomycetes. And of course, the labyrinthiolomycetes. Just to put a little um, timestamp on that. The estimated sort of origin and diversification time for that photosynthetic crown group is around 250 million years ago. They were probably around before then. There was a big extinction event. They diversified and took over the oceans. Whereas the date on the divergence of the labyrinthiolomycetes is probably around a billion to a billion and a quarter years ago, something like that. So they're a pretty anciently diverged group of eukaryotes. And I wanna make the point that a billion years ago, there were no plants in the ocean. There were no animals in the ocean. There were no kelps or diatoms. This group evolved in an ocean that was biologically completely different than it is now. So those interactions between various labyrinthiolomycetes and marine plants and animals and other things have all evolved along this branch since the divergence of that group a billion years ago. Okay, I'm gonna zoom in on the labyrinthiolomycete branch so I can tell you a little more about the current diversity of this group. This is only based on cultivated strains. Uh, of course, we know from environmental sequencing that there are additional labyrinthiolomyces in the ocean that nobody has cultivated yet. I'm going to ignore those for now. The very first named genus in the group was Labyrinthia. You can tell it was the first name because the whole group still carries that root word. And it comes from the um, 
common name for these organisms as slime nets, which describes their growth habit as colonial <laughs> microbes that share a slime way or a slime track that I'm gonna to refer to as the ectoplasmic network. It's the structure that connects the cells to the surface. And in the case of the labyrinthulas, lets them move around on that surface. And for the labyrinthulas, you may recognize that word. Often that substrate is a seagrass or an alga. Um, so this group was named about 150 years ago, around the time of the American Civil War. So they've been known for a very long time and were originally studied by mycologists. They were taken as fungi and studied by people who study funguses. The next isolated and named groups belong to this big cluster here, this multi-generic group called the Thraustochytrids. The first one named was Thraustochytrium and then Schizochytrium. My study species, Arantiochytrium, is in here. The disease agent of QPX, which we named Mucochytrium cohagii, is also in here. The Thraustochytrids are quite distinct from the labyrinthulas. They're solitary, they're not colonial, although they do grow in clumps. Um, they have an ectoplasmic network to attach to the substrate, but they don't appear to use it for motility. These other two groups are much more recently recognized because morphologically it's hard to tell them from the thrastochytrids, so it's taken additional information to separate them. But I do want to mention, in particular, the planochytrids, which you can see here are closest to the labyrinthulas. They're also solitary, like the thrastochytrids, but they seem to be able to move using their ectoplasmic network. And as far as I can tell, based on our data and other people's data, a planochytrids are actually the most abundant labyrinthial mycetes in the oceans. Uh, they are a little harder to grow and a little harder to study, so we know less about them, but I eventually want to learn much more about them for that reason. Okay, I'm sure I'm forgetting to tell you something. Oh, so Thrasochytrids and Schizochytrium were named in the early 1900s. The labyrinthulas and the Thraustochytrids spent many decades sort of independently bouncing around taxonomy as people tried to figure out where they belonged. And it was until the 1980s that it became absolutely clear that they are not fungi, although we are stuck with the fungus names, like Chytrium, but they are straminophiles. Okay, I mentioned to you a very simple description of one part of a life cycle of a thraustochytrid, which involves a zoosporangium releasing zoospores that can swim around, become a vegetative cell, develop ectoplasmic network. Uh, and I just want to say that these organisms actually have much more complicated life cycles than that, uh, about which we have very little understanding about what regulates decisions. So for example, the rantiochytrium my strain gets its specific name, Limacinum, from its tendency to form slug-like crawling cells or amoeboid cells that I'll show you a video of later. It also forms various other kinds of sporangia and probably has a sexual reproduction cycle involving a meiotic zoospore. Okay, tell you a little more about the ectoplasmic network. This is just a sketch on one side of a labyrinthial colony to remind me to say that the ectoplasmic network is quite thin unless a cell is moving through it and then the ectoplasmic network kind of expands to accommodate the cell as it moves through. And you can actually watch the cells moving around in the ectoplasmic network, it's pretty cool. This is a microscope image from Daisuke Honda of a clump of Arantiochytrium cells that have ectoplasmic network growing out. And you can see the network sort of covering the surface, kind of like it's exploring the surface. The ectoplasmic network um, divides and anastomoses. It's a very um, flexible, dynamic construct. And I know that the name sounds kind of silly. It sounds kind of like the sci-fi channel, right? Ectoplasmic network. Um, I didn't name it, it's not my fault. And it has a legitimate reason for existing. The 
the layer of the cytoplasm right at the outside of a cell is called the ectoplasm. And that's where the ectoplasmic network connects. So that's how it came to be named as the ectoplasmic network. Yeah? What was the scale in that? Um, so that is going to be about five microns. So most of the phthalae are, you know, five, 10, 20 ish microns. And the labyrinthula spindle cells will be maybe five microns wide and 10 or 20 long. So in the period of the 1960s and 70s, there was this big boom in ultrastructural studies, a wide variety of protists thanks to breakthroughs in transmission electron microscopy. And uh, a lot of work was done at that time on the ectoplasmic network of labyrinthulos, of grassocytids. So I can basically describe to you the outcome of that. This is a TEM image. This part here is the ectoplasmic network of a cell. This part is the cell body. This sort of pit here where the ectoplasmic network goes into the cell body is called the bothrosome. So what we know from these studies is that the ectoplasmic network is membrane bound. There's membrane on the outside. And that membrane is continuous with the cell plasma membrane in the bothrosome. The EN contains no cytoplasmic organelles, so it is not simply continuous with the cytoplasm, and that's one of the features that makes the ectoplasmic network the unique and defining feature of this group of organisms. It's an unusual characteristic. There's no ribosomes, there's no mitochondria, there's just an actin cytoskeleton and various membrane elements you can see inside here, which uh, change and develop depending on what food resources the ectoplasmic network is in contact with. Where the inside of the ectoplasmic network connects to the cytoplasm is a structure here I'm going to call the saginogenitosome. And exactly how that works and what that's made of is a big mystery that I would love to figure out the answer to. Here's another image, a much better image, of a saginogenitosome. Maybe you can see what looked like the ends of endoplasmic reticulum elements kind of coming in here. So somehow, this structure mediates communication between the cell body and the inside of the ectoplasmic network. Um, so I've been working for a number of years to figure out what these structures are made of, how they evolved, how they might be related to other structures in eukaryotic diversity. Uh, my colleague Joshua Rest and I, who's been working with me on Orangiochytrium for many years now, are um, getting close to the end of a project, actually funded by a SOMA seed grant, where uh, our postdoc, Anbu, and Joshua's grad student, Alex, did an experiment. It took zoospores, allowed them to develop for several hours, and collected samples at different times while the cells were producing the ectoplasmic network subjected those to a proteomics analysis, and we've identified some of the proteins that increase in abundance over that time course as potentially being candidate genes for being involved in the saginogenosome and the EN, and we are in the midst of following up on those candidate genes using the, some of the molecular genetic methods I'll tell you about in a little bit. Otherwise, if you want to know more about the proteomics study, I'll tell you later. I don't have time to go into that today. The proteomics um, analysis was enabled by my long time investment in trying to build genomic resources for these organisms. So one of the early things I did was to uh, pull together a bunch of collaborators and write a community sequencing proposal to the Joint Genome Institute. This was like 2009, I think trying to convince them that they should sequence the genomes of some of these organisms for us. And they agreed. And from that, we got genomic assemblies for Orantiochytrium, another Charlestochytrium, Schizochytrium, and for an Aplanochytrium. And all I want to say here is that from a genomic perspective, these organisms are completely reasonable to work with. The genomes are huge, 35 to 65 megabases. They are not terribly full of repeat elements, so they're not perfectly contiguous, but there aren't thousands of contigs. There's only hundreds of contigs. 
there's on the order of 11,000 to 15,000 predicted proteins, which is not all that many less than in our genome. Uh, there are introns, but they are not long enough or common enough to make it hard to predict genes. So the, the genomes are um, pretty easy to work with. And when I say here, short read genome sequencing, for those who aren't familiar with the technology, that means individual pieces of DNA, I'll say between about 300 and 500 base pairs in length are sequenced, and then they're all put together like a big jigsaw puzzle to try to assemble the genome. Right. So I talked about DHA. Traustochytrids is commercial workhorses for DHA production. There's also a lot of interest in the biotech companies who are using these organisms to use them as platforms for other high value products. And two targets people are working on are squalene and carotenoids. And you may recognize both of these as isoprenoids. So the products of the same biosynthetic pathways. Uh, here I've got the structures for beta carotene and astaxanthin, which are both carotenoids that Arantiochytrium can produce as can some other trousochytrids. Any of you who thought much about carotenoids may be thinking, uh, you told me this is a heterotrophic organism. Why is it making carotenoids? That's a really good question, I think. So carotenoids are usually associated with photosynthetic organisms. They are absolutely required for photosynthesis, mainly because they help to manage the production of toxic reactive oxygen species by chlorophyll. And I mean, chlorophyll is absolutely deadly, terrible biochemical to live next to. So built into the photosynthetic apparatus are carotenoids to manage that production of reactive oxygen species. So anywhere there's photosynthesis, over here in the archaeoplastids, here among the photosynthetic piles, you're going to find carotenoids. OK, well. There's also carotenoids in Arantiochytrium and other Traustochytrids, but they are heterotrophic, so they don't have chlorophyll. That's a little strange. There aren't very many other examples of carotenogenic eukaryotic organisms. There's a fungus or two. Here's an uh, image of some colonies of Xanthophyllomyces. And it's known that this fungus got the ability to make carotenoids by horizontal gene transfer from bacteria. It's also known that this fungus then shared those genes with some insects that can produce carotenoids thanks to horizontal gene transfer from the fungus. And there really are very few other examples. So one of our initial questions was, well, how about Arantiochytrium and the other carotenogenic labyrinthiolomyces? Did they get the ability to make carotenoids by horizontal gene transfer or is there maybe some deeper relationship indicating their connection to the photosynthetic stromatopiles? I mean, is that where they got their ability to make carotenoids? Well, uh, this was one of the big questions of my PhD student, Mariana Rios's dissertation. Uh, this work was published about a year ago. Uh, we'll do the first question first. How did Arantiochytrium acquire carotenoid biosynthesis? Um, I will prove to you later, for now I'm just going to assert, that the gene that Thraustochytrids, here's Arantiochytrium, Schizochytrium, and Hondia, two other Thraustochytrids, the gene they use to make beta-carotene, which is the first carotenoid, from the isoprenoid product, geronyl geronyl pyrophosphate, looks like this. It takes three activities to do that reaction from GGPP to beta-carotene. You need a phytoene synthase, you need a phytoene desaturase, you need a lycopene cyclase, CRT, B, I, and Y. And in these organisms, all those activities are fused together in one gene, which to me makes total sense. You need all these three activities together. There's no reason to stop in the middle. Why wouldn't you fuse them all into one protein? Seems very logical to me, and yet, you can find basically no other organism that does this. Bacteria don't do this. We can't find anybody else who does this. So when Mariana wanted to answer our question, where did this gene came, come from? She couldn't do it by looking at the whole gene together. There was nothing to compare it to. What she had to do 
was look at each domain independently. And she did um, really quite impressive phylogenetic reconstructions for CRTIBY and a related domain. I don't actually expect you to see the details of these trees. I'm just going to point out in each of these, there's a cluster of kind of blue sequences with a star. And then I'm going to tell you about the organisms that are represented in that cluster and that they're the same for each of these domains. So what Mariana found was related domains scattered among protists, sometimes fused together and sometimes not. So the first example I'll mention is a protist called Thicomonas trahens. It's an Apusamonad. It lives way over here on the other side of the tree next to the Apisticons. It has a gene with CRTIBY plus a fourth domain. What that domain does, so you know we all need beta carotene in our diet, right? And the reason we need beta carotene is because we cleave it in half to make retinal, which is the chromophore, for the auxins in our eyes that let us detect light. BLH is that oxygenase that splits beta carotene in half to make retinal. So to me, having all four of those activities fused together suggests that what Thicomonas does is make beta carotene in order to have an endogenous source of retinal. Presumably it has some rhodopsins that it uses for light sensing in its ecology. The other organisms in which Mariana found related domains are two strange dinoflagellates. That's a little redundant. Dinoflagellates are all strange, but these are <laughs> super strange dinoflagellates. And you've heard of both of them. Noctilucosynthalins is a really big dinoflagellate. It's big enough it can eat fish eggs. It's famous for forming blooms. Really strange dinoflagellate, though. But it has evolutionarily related domains in two fusions, B with Y and I with Y. And the other dinoflagellate is Oxyris marina. Very strange, commonly used lab uh, zooplankton model organism, but very strange. It has the same four domains, but apparently not fused together, present as monogenes. Um, these domains are related to each other in this group of organisms. They are not related to the carotenoid biosynthetic genes in fungi. They are not related to the carotenoid biosynthetic genes in photosynthetic eukaryotes. They represent a completely independent origin of carotenoid biosynthesis in eukaryotes by horizontal gene transfer, probably from an actinobacterium, a bacteroidetes, or an archaea. We can't get good enough resolution in our trees to be sure. And we don't have, well, we have several hypotheses about how the genes might have spread around, but we haven't figured out how to test any of them. So all I can tell you is that this is the pattern, not how it became this way. Okay, so the basic brief answer to that first question by horizontal gene transfer. Uh, next question, why have carotenoids? And I actually, I think I'm gonna cut this a little short because of time. Um, so I've already suggested to you possible reasons to have carotenoids. One is as an endogenous source of retinal. Orantiochytrium has three rhodopsins uh, that it presumably uses for phototaxis and maybe for other uh, light sensing functions. And I also described to you the role of carotenoids in protection from reactive oxygen species. In our standard growth conditions, these are, these are cell pellets of Orantiochytrium that were grown in two different media, a poor medium called 790, a rich medium called GPY. Uh, and you'll see that the pellet in the richer medium is much bigger. A lot of that difference is fatty acid accumulation. And it's also much oranger. And in our standard growth conditions, the production of lipids is associated with the production of carotenoids, suggesting a specific possible role for carotenoids is to protect lipids stored in lipid droplets from peroxidation by a reactive oxygen species. And one reason that might be important is that uh, you can get a peroxidation chain reaction of lipids in a lipid droplet where it only takes one reactive oxygen species to oxidize a whole bunch of lipids. Having carotenoids in there would probably protect lipids because the carotenoids could take up the reactive oxygen species. So that's our basic, basic hypothesis. Um, 
I'm going to tie it very quickly to the ecology of our antiochytrium, which I described as a mangrove specialist, by suggesting that if you're one of the early pioneers settling a decomposing mangrove leaf and it is still green and it is floating in a relatively shallow mangrove forest getting a lot of tropical sun, that's probably going to be a really high reactive oxygen stress sort of habitat. So maybe having carotenoids would be a good idea. Okay, so how do we test these hypotheses? Well, what if we could make carotenoid-free mutants? This is the other big part of Mariana's dissertation. She developed the methods by which we can replace endogenous genes with a copy that's been inactivated by a gene cassette giving the cells resistance to an antibiotic, in this case, zeosin. And this is a photograph of an auger plate on which little toothpick street colonies of wild type and two of Mariana's carotenoid-less Orantiochytrium mutants are growing. And they're, we didn't give them any fancy names, they're just called 32 and 33. <laughs> um, so we have these mutants. Uh, I'm gonna skip over uh, the next couple slides and just summarize here. I'd be happy to tell anybody more about that who wants to know more about this. Uh, summarizing the genetics of Thraustochytrids, are part of a diverse group of protists that don't make any evolutionary sense, who have acquired related CRTIBY genes. And uh, we can expose Orantiochytrium to methylene blue, which is kind of a chlorophyll analog, it absorbs energy from light to produce reactive oxygen species. And when we do that, we can induce carotenoid accumulation without lipid accumulation in wild type Orantiochytrium, supporting the redox stress hypothesis. And we have evidence from those same methylene blue experiments that it looks like in the mutants, other redox stress responsive pathways are up-regulated. Uh, we're in the middle of doing a bunch of RNA-seq analysis, which was like getting that RNA-seq was the last thing Mariana did before she left. And we're seeing evidence consistent with that hypothesis in those data. Okay. Sorry to cut the carotenoid short, but that's how it has to be. Because I want to tell you about the genome or antiochytrium. Um, so I'm going to go back to this point where we have these mutants. We needed to diagnose the recombination event that had happened in the genome so that we were sure what kind of mutants we had. We use standard methods, PCR, southern blots. And it was pretty clear that mutant 32 was exactly what we wanted. It was a very simple recombination event. Whereas in mutant 33, we could not tell what was going on. And not long before the pandemic, I was at a meeting where I was whining about what a hard time we were having figuring out what mutant 33 was. And uh, John Archibald from Dalhousie heard me complaining, came up to me and said, hey, I just got a nanopore sequencing gizmo. I have a student who needs a project. What if we sequence those for you? To which I said, yes, please. So for those who are not familiar with nanopore, nanopore, in contrast to the sequencing I mentioned earlier, where you get eh, three, four, or 500 base pairs of sequence, nanopore can sequence a single piece of DNA for tens of thousands of base pairs. So it can resolve repeating structures that there's no way you can reassemble from short read sequencing. So that's when we had some evidence from our PCR that was some kind of repeat thing going on in 33. So we had a reason to believe nanopore might help. And indeed, it helped a lot. So thanks to the nanopore, I can show you a little a uh, sketch of what the CRT IBY locus looks like in the wild type, which is exactly as it should look, what it looks like in mutant 32, where part of the CRT IBY gene has been replaced by our little zeosin resistance gene cassette here. And then here's what happened in 33, where we got some kind of triple tandem integration event, including a couple copies of the plasmid backbone, and it's a huge mess. And CRT IBY is clearly inactivated, but it was just in some really complicated way. Um, and we would have never figured it out without nanopore. So that was great. But that was actually just the beginning. So then I was talking to Josh one day 
and I said, hey, Josh, we have all this nanopore. Why don't we see if we can assemble the genome from the nanopore, right? And uh, Eric Lavington, a recent graduate from Ecology and Evolution, helped us do this. This is actually Eric's assembly. So here's a comparison of the short grade genome I mentioned earlier with the nanopore assembly. You'll see the nanopore assembly is about three megabases longer. It has fewer contigs, so it's more contiguous. And really interestingly to us, some of the things that were missing in the JGI genome were telomeric repeats, which are found at the ends of chromosomes usually, and ribosomal RNA genes were missing. Probably those things were missing on purpose because JGI excludes repeaty stuff to make its assembly work, but we didn't have any trouble assembling those features with the nanopore sequence. So we had telomeres and ribosomal RNAs. But this paper just came out in current biology recently, um, not because of the nanopore assembly. In a few minutes, I'll tell you why it got in current biology. Okay. The 26 longest nanopore contigs range in length from one to four million base pairs. That's consistent with the length of things that show up in pulse field gel electrophoresis, which is a method that lets you get some idea what a genome physically looks like. We think these represent 26 chromosomes of Arantiochytrium because in most cases there are telomeric repeats on at least one, usually both ends. And you may also notice this little red bar in my key here labeled RDNA. So the little red lines in this schematic represent ribosomal RNA genes. And I think you'll see that by far, most of those genes are at the ends of these putative chromosomes. Oh, the telomeres are usually TTAGP, GG, about 500 base pairs long. So what the, this is a schematic sort of summary of what the end of an Arantiochytrium chromosome usually looks like. There's a telomeric repeat. About 10 kb away, there's a 18S, 28S ribosomal RNA gene cluster always transcribed toward the telomere. About another 10 kb upstream, there's a 5S ribosomal RNA gene always transcribed away from the telomere. And in between, we've identified five different kinds of long tandem repeat elements that are present in consistent positions. There's always a group one element just downstream of the 28S. There's always a group two element just in from the telomere. There's always a group zero between the 18S and the 5S, and a group five uh, sort of in from the 5S. Now, this is a schematic because Obviously, all the chromosome ends don't look the same. If they all look the same, we would not have been able to assemble them into chromosomes. So they're all slightly distinct from each other, but variations on a theme. So this figure shows for the 26 chromosomes, the 50 kb on the left end and the 50 kb on the right end. And I hope you'll see basically just what I've described, right? There's variations on the common theme that I just summarized for you previously, right? Ribosomal RNA operon, 5S gene, particular kinds of long tandem repeats. This is completely novel. We haven't found anybody else report this kind of organization in the subtelomeric regions of chromosomes before. One possible reason for that is not very many people have put together nanopore genome assemblies yet. Maybe People are going to start doing that, and this is going to turn out to be totally normal. Maybe people are going to start doing that, and this is going to turn out to be a really strange or antiochytrium thing. I, I can't wait to learn the answer to that question. Okay, then I want to wrap up by telling you about the 27th contig. I'm going to call it CE1. This is really different than the other 26. It doesn't have any ribosomal RNA genes. It doesn't have any telomeres. In fact, it's circular mapping. So it seems to be circular. I'm gonna call it an epizome or circular element one. It's about 300 kb long. There is an element that size in the pulse field gel electrophoresis. So apparently it's a real thing. Most fascinating to me 
CE1 is present at about ninefold higher coverage than the rest of the genome in both the nanopore and the GGI assemblies, which were sequenced completely independently more than a decade apart. So this is some really consistent feature, uh, which actually, given a meeting I just had yesterday, I mean, I'm, I used to not be confused about that. Now I'm super confused about that. But anyway, it's a fact. Um, it contains many predicted genes, many of which are expressed, but very few of which have any useful annotations. Can't tell what they are. Um, and there's a similar, oh, it's about 75% identical at the nucleotide level region at the left end of chromosome 15, which is also the only place in the genome you get ribosomal RNAs in the middle of a chromosome. Uh, Josh and I struggled with this for a really long time. Josh found some evidence that there are genes related to viruses on these elements, but they didn't look like any known virus. We couldn't say, hey, we found the X virus. I spent a huge amount of time trying to figure out if I could call it a plasmid. How do you, how do you tell what's a plasmid in a eukaryote? Right? How to think about this was a real problem. And then a paper appeared in BioArchive. And before too long in Nature, is uh, just out earlier earlier last year, Gaia et al. 2023, describing a brand new group of viruses from marine metagenomes, where they're quite abundant. And they named this group the Myris viracota. What's really strange about them is that they're a mixture of features from completely distinct groups of viruses. So they share genes with the very DNA viria, which includes most of the well-known large nucleocytoplasmic DNA viruses, for example, that Joaquin was talking about last week. Those are mostly NCLDVs of the very DNA viria. But the protein coat, as, as Joaquin put it last week, the bad news wrapped in a protein coat, the protein coat part of these viruses belongs to a completely different realm of viruses that includes herpes viruses. Do you remember that? Um, right about this time, Lucy Gallo Lavalier, who had done her dissertation work on NCLDVs, joined John's lab as a postdoc. So she had like all the tools in her toolkit. She jumped right in to do a deeper analysis on this and found indeed for CE1 and for the left in the chromosome 15, they contain all the proteins you need to make a myris virus virion module. All the proteins you need for that. They contain none of the proteins you need to make an NCLDV type virus module, which Josh and I already thought was true, but uh, Lucy confirmed it. And they contain a variety of other proteins that are common between the two groups of viruses. And um, Lucy followed this up with a phylogenetic analysis, which shows that the elements on CE1 and the leptin of chromosome 15 are related to the Myris viruses Gaia L identified, but they're distinct. They're actually a distinct sort of Myris virus-like group of viruses. And I want to point out here um, that in the Gaia paper, they were unable to identify the host or any of the Myris viruses. So the reason our paper got accepted by current biology is we were the first ones to say, hey, we found a host for Myers viruses. So that's, that was just good timing. Okay, let's see if I can tell you this one last story. Because students, it's really good to read the old literature sometimes. So I'm gonna tell you a story about this paper that's 50 years old now from science, because I'm an insurance sign, because I'm and Schoenstein were in that group of people doing electron microscopy on all kinds of protists, including a throustochytrid they had isolated from the York River estuary in Virginia. And the thing they noticed about their throustochytrid was that only under very specific growth conditions, they observed the production of what looked like herpes virus particles. Not all the time, they were unable to cure their culture of this capacity. So they referred to it as an endogenous virus that was activated under specific conditions. I want you to notice the title of the paper, 
herpes type virus particles associated with a fungus. Okay, not a fungus, a thrasochytrid, but this was an era of taxonomic confusion. And the reason it's in science is because herpes viruses are unique to animals. Only metazoans have herpes viruses. So it was big news if anything else had a herpes virus. But is it a herpes virus? Or did Kazama and Schornstein witness the activation of a latent endogenous Myers virus in the Strauss kitchen? Do I know the answer to that question? Because I cannot, I don't think their culture exists any longer. So I'll never be able to answer that question. Um, I want to make one other connection with herpes viruses. Um, so I think you all know herpes viruses are famous for establishing latent infections in their hosts. And they can do that in two different ways. You probably, if you had chicken pox, you have chicken pox hiding in your nerve cells as an episome right now, waiting for a chance to come out and give you shingles. Other herpes viruses make latent infections by incorporating themselves into the host genome as a something like the left end of chromosome 15. So maybe Myris viruses do both of those things as well. And Arantiochytrium is infected by two of those viruses. No one's ever reported that Arantiochytrium has a virus. It grows just fine in culture. There's no hint that there's any problem. Um, maybe many Thrustochytrids are virogenic. I thought I was crazy suggesting that until I talked to Joaquin last week. And he's like, oh no, I think this is all the, I think this is all over the place. This happens all the time. So now I no longer feel crazy. And I also no longer feel like it's so unique either. <laughs> um, okay, so just quick genome summary. We're in the midst of working with the Archibald lab. This is a TEM image taken just a couple of weeks ago in John Archibald's lab, showing what looked like herpes virus particles in Arantiochytrium under normal culture conditions. Uh, so we're closing in on our goal of um, actually isolating virions for these viruses. And so I hope I've explained to you why I have invested so much energy in developing this model system, why I think it's so fascinating, not only to investigate known features of thrasopitrids, but to look into new things like what's going on with these slug-like cells you can see crawling around and what's going on with the virus viruses. Quick questions. Never got to the squally. Oh yeah, I didn't. Um, <laughs> and uh, they they actually can make a lot of squalene, but I and I haven't looked into it any further than that. Squalene is a C thirty compound. Carotenoids are a C forty compounds. So. But again, squalene, the major source for squalene is shark livers. So it goes. It's another sort of trying to make a more um, renewable resource for some of these yeah. bioproducts. Yeah. Yeah. Any evidence of expression into RNA seq data of the viruses? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's in the RNA seq for sure. Yep. In the in the right JGI and in the MMETSP. Yeah. Yeah. And you said that I don't know the name at all. The people who saw the herpes-like virus, their their culture said that it's similar. If you expose your cultures to the same conditions that they're to get similar? Well, so that's what actually, that's what we've been working on with the Archibald lab. Um, but it turns out we don't have to do that. Uh, so again, th this is a TEM of a cell that's just grown under our normal conditions. And uh, the poor student in John's lab who's been tasked with counting all the electron microscopy says maybe a 2% of all the cells in a normal culture or full of viruses. So what were the special conditions? That... So what well, Kazama and Schornstein saw it was when they took zoospores and settled them under starvation conditions. So if they didn't give the zoospores anything to eat, hmm. uh, then they saw the viral production. So our hypothesis was this sort of, uh, my mental model was based on like latent herpes viruses, right? They escape when the host gets stressed. Yeah. But now, I don't know, now I'm thinking maybe that's not the strategy. Maybe the strategy is, you know, when your host is happy, you sort of randomly take out a one or 2% of the population. Um, I, I think it's a fascinating 
question that we're going to try to figure out how to answer. Yeah. Is it possible to replicate that experiment in a stressful and a happy condition? Yes. Yeah. That's exactly, that's what we're working on. The, but the, so the complication is when you put them in the stressful condition. So for example, if you put them in starvation conditions, which is what Selma and Schoenstein did, you are going to greatly reduce the cell's capability to do any biosynthetic activity, like make viruses. And the other treatment we tried to use was, was cold treatment. Orantio is a tropical organism. It does not like being cold. But again, you put it in the cold, you're going to really crimp its style. It's not going to be able to do much biosynthetic activity. So we've we realized we put ourselves in a little bit of a conundrum. There's a lot of drugs that can be used to induce herpes viruses. So we're going to try some of those because then we can keep them under the same growth conditions and see if we can turn the virus on. So this is more so the ongoing project right now. Yes, okay. working on it right now. So that, that happy interaction with John Archibald seven years ago was the beginning of an increasingly fruitful collaboration. So yeah, we're working on it. Yeah? Under starvation, uh, happy conditions, is there ever seen a big difference in the viral reproduction? Yeah, great question. Don't know the answer yet. <laughs> we are like literally yesterday, we came to this conclusion that there's more virus in heavy cells. So we are just starting to try to figure that out, which is why now I'm confused about that consistent ninefold number, right? Um, yeah. Great questions. Kamzima. Yeah, most of this went over my head, but um, I'm, I'm still wondering why you wouldn't find me. I, this is an open, but I, uh, <laughs> why can they be found in uh, alkaline lakes? Uh, oh, actually, I don't. They um, might be. I've never looked at data from. I don't know how they would be with the pH, honestly. And I haven't ever looked. I've never looked at a sort of, you know, environmental genomic data set from one of those. And I have never seen a report of anyone isolating any of these organisms from that habitat, but I, I can take a look and see. Yeah. You might think they'd be able to survive, or I, I imagine they're in like Great Salt Lake. I, I suspect they're there, right? but it's salty. Yeah. Good questions. I don't know how they would do a high pH though. Yeah. Uh, so I might have missed the point when you made this, but you mentioned that the herpes virus sequences are found inside the uh, the host organism. Yeah. Uh, how did we differentiate this from a herpes virus to a myers virus? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, they're clearly not herpes viruses. Okay. Yeah, they're um, they're myers viruses. Okay. But um, evolutionarily, they're much more closely related to herpes viruses than well. Should be careful. The Proteins that make up the virus, the protein shell, are more closely related to herpes viruses than to the NCLDs. And so are the other proteins. The trees are just less clear. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, everyone.